so cool. OMG, LOL, hashtag, hashtag. Um, first of all, I just want to express my gratitude for, to Joel and Creative Mornings for the invitation to come and spend some time with you and to really just spend time in community in a moment in which I actually believe community is the only thing that is going to get us out of this. And when I talk about this, I think about it in terms of someone who has spent the past 20 years, and I'm starting when I'm young, so. The past 20 years, um, thinking about racial justice and thinking about fighting for equality. And a few weeks ago, I had this moment where I thought, all of this work has made no difference when I think about the political climate and the moment we're in. And there was something that was really sobering about this idea. Has anything changed? Or is this moment asking me to change and to change the way I do things? And so these reflections coincided with Joel's invitation. And so today I'm going to talk to you about my life as a historian that was really informed by a deep desire to change what that meant in the service of the public good. So I'm going to do that. But the first thing I'm going to disclose is that I am not creative. I mean really not creative. I was that kid who couldn't get the art projects together. I can't cut a straight line. I took a knitting class and it was very emotionally disturbing because it was so bad. Um, this dress I'm wearing is really fly, but it's only because someone cooler posted about it online, so I bought one. This was not my idea. So, and then Joel sends me the link to you know, what other people have done and everyone is so cool and creative. Um, so I am not creative. I am not someone who has ever signed my name to a piece of art or I've never written a play or a poem that I was proud of. Um, but I am so grateful to have been inspired by other people who are deeply creative and really rethink what it means to be a historian. So I'm not creative, but I have a vision for the world I want to help create. And it's that vision that I bring to my classroom, to my public speaking, to my writing, and to my various projects that allows me to use new metaphors and new language for what equality can look like and feel like for all of us. And so a few years ago, I had an opportunity to expand my platform, which is such a weird idea. I don't know what the platform means. It's, people say this. So I get to expand my platform. <laughs> Um, and engage in a larger conversation and expand my classroom. And so I'm going to talk about three substantive experiences I've had, and then I'll stop talking, and I know we have a little time for Q&A, and that's really where the fun happens. And so today I want to talk to you about imagining equality, using some wonderful pieces of art that have helped me bridge that divide um, in my classrooms, depending, regardless of where students are coming from, their own experiences with power, their own feelings of feeling more equal or less equal than others, I try to narrate um, a series of experiences uh, through art. And so many of us have seen this iconic painting of Ruby Bridges integrating Franz Elementary School in New Orleans in 1960. The poignancy of this image is not lost um, on all of us. And for me, images like this really created the structure for me to become a historian of African American girls and girlhood. Why this little girl, why this particular moment, set me down a course of several years of researching the experiences of black girls in Great Migration Chicago. And one of the questions that was always central in my research project for my first book was, what did it mean to be a girl, and what did it mean to carry the expectations and hope of your entire community? If equality was to be realized on the, on the back of black girls, what did that feel like? And in that process, one of the things that I discovered was the way that African American girls and their labor on behalf of equality for their communities led them to become African American women who were also engaging in unacknowledged and uncompensated labor for the possibility of equality for all. And that exploration helped me think differently about how I teach the past to my students. 
One of the kind of great debates among historians, and it's not that cool, is um, is history the story of change over time or continuity in light of our ideas of progress? And so when I think about this image and I think about this photograph, we also recognize the deep poignancy of Ruby Bridges and a representative from the Norman Rockwell Foundation, of course, delivering this painting to President Barack Obama. Right? This is an incredible image. And to think about teaching my students what needed to happen between the painting of Ruby Bridges and the presentation of a painting of Ruby Bridges to a black president is something that we have to really struggle with. And in that process, I also started to use this painting, which is probably more indicative of the experiences my students have had. And this is um, New Kids in the Neighborhood, Negro in the Suburbs, that Rockwell also painted in the 1960s to talk about this moment in US history where everything was going to change, or everything was supposed to change. The affluent African-American family moving into a suburbs, and this moment where these children look at each other, right? With a, with a bit of curiosity, with a um, bit of hesitation, this is the world that a number of my students live in. And so to think about this image, and how it connects them to a history that is decades old, but still resonates, is one of the most powerful ways that I can get people interested in thinking about history from a different lens. When I travel, if I'm in a taxi or in a shuttle, people say, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a history professor. And then they proceed to tell me why they hated history classes so much as a child. <laughs> it's not fun. Don't do that, right? History is the worst, I hated it, it was a bunch of facts and date. And then they say, and as I got older, I started to appreciate what history could teach me. And if we can reverse that process a bit and get young people engaged in history, perhaps more historical thinking will be used in, I don't know, developing policies, or leading a country, or interacting with your neighbors. And so one of the greatest gifts that I have available to me as a history educator is the art that captures a moment that allows us to get into the complexity. Another visual that started to inform my teaching was these, this racial dot map. It's shared a lot online that the University of Virginia's Cooper Center for Public Service created. And one of the things that I think is amazing about this, this racial um, dot map, it allows us to enter that moment in the Rockwell painting of where and how people live. And when I go on the road, I have like, I say the same three things everywhere because I'm not that creative. But one of the ways that I try to talk to the audience is I do a map of the area that we're in. And so here we are in our city, Washington, DC. And if this map does anything, it alerts us to, again, the deep tension of understanding progress as something we all enjoy and understanding the ways that we're deeply tethered to the past. And so in illustrating what a racial divide looks like on its most granular, granular level, and you can actually, with this map, go down to streets and major thoroughfares, and you can start to see the way that the highways are one of the greatest indicators of racial um, segregation and divides. You can look at these maps over time to understand the impact of gentrification on communities. And in this process, what you're able to do is to connect the kind of hard data that we need to make a case for why the call for equality never gets old, and at the same time, creates things that are visually stunning and disturbing all at the same time. And so this is the type of creativity that I'm grateful for people in the social sciences to understand how we can have this conversation. My lectures on um, residential segregation in the highways are the best lectures in the world. But guess what? <laughs> Um, there are a lot of folks who will never enroll in my classes, but the capacity to bring this type of image to audiences, to broad audiences, and then talk to the elders in the audience who remember when this map were, was different and what happened and how we're still living with those consequences is an amazing opportunity. 
So that's the teaching stuff. I was engaged in another process in August of 2015 that you may have read about in um, the New York Times, which depending on who you ask is failing or winning or something in between. Um, the New York Times wrote a story about Georgetown University and the legacy of slavery. In August 2015, I was asked to serve on the working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. And in 2015, we were a few months from the tragedy at Mother Emanuel um, AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. A new conversation about the appropriateness of the Confederate flag was circulating in the culture, and uh, our university president said, you know what we should do? We should talk about slavery. I said, really, should we do that? And he said, yes. <laughs> and one of the reasons we were talking about slavery is that we were part of a moment in which colleges and universities were asking different questions about how we want to imagine our origins and our past. You may have read about um, Corey Menefee, a worker at Yale University, who destroyed this stained glass window um, representation of cotton picking and, and slavery in the John C. the formerly known as John C. Calhoun College at Yale University. And the conversation about Calhoun College was also informing our conversation at Georgetown's campus about two residence halls that had been named for two Jesuit priests who had facilitated the sale of 272 people in 1838, a move to try to save the university from some financial instability. And the question about Georgetown and slavery required us to not only think about the namings of buildings, because that's the easy work. The question is, how do you reconcile an unforgivable sin in the past? And in that process, we started to do the things that we do well at a university. We did incredible research that allowed for some families to find the various branches of their family tree. We did the educational stuff. Students got very involved and did documentary projects and podcasts, and we started to imagine a way in which the history of slavery could inform our goals as a university rather than sit within our archive as a university. And in that process, we became closer to a group of people who have called themselves loosely the descendants. The descendants of the 272 who were sold from plantations in Southern Maryland to slavery in Louisiana, in the sugar cane fields. And if you know anything about um, sugar in Louisiana, you understand how nefarious that sale was. And so in the process of connecting with the descendant community, of talking to people who find themselves learning that they are related to people they had never met, finding photographs like this one that was in an archive at Nickel State. This is a photograph that we believe is of one of the 272. And in that process, we made history not only an opportunity for research on race and the building of US institutions, but we used our research as a basis for a racial justice project that required us to understand fully what it took for universities to expand in the United States. The fact of slaveholding and universities is not that interesting. We know because of the size, the prestige, the power, the wealth of many institutions that they were deeply, deeply entangled in the system of slavery. This is not the new fact. The new possibility rests in our ability to be creative about what our responsibility is today to that past. And being engaged in conversations about universities and slavery has created a community of people who are thinking differently about university history. And so the, expira the exploration into slavery has been an exploration into Native American land removal, has been an exploration in US-Mexico border relations, has been a conversation in the way that urban campuses exacerbate the impacts of gentrification. Worker policies keep a lot of university workers unable to live near the campuses that they toil on. 
All of these conversations are made possible and made real because of the type of research that we as historians have brought to the table and the various ways that the images and the impact of this legacy can be made real today. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. And finally, I'm gonna talk about um, an opportunity to organize educators in ways that we usually don't organize. And this was an experience I had in August of 2014. I am a graduate of the University of Missouri in Columbia, and some of my friends from college are here. It's good to see you. And like many people in August 2014, I watched way too much cable news about what was happening in Ferguson, Missouri. And the tragedy in Ferguson, Missouri, for those of us from the Midwest, it's deeply familiar the type of town that Ferguson is. These towns that are sometimes clustered around airports. They are near major metropolitan cities, but, but um, worlds away. Places that are both connected and disconnected from jobs and from various opportunities. And to watch a crisis unfold in the types of towns that I knew when I was a student in Missouri, when I was a faculty member in Oklahoma City, growing up in um, Chicago, something resonated deeply with that story. But it wasn't until I was talking to my husband about this, on, he was watching the news, and he said, you know, they're not going to have the first day of school in Ferguson. They're, they're closing schools um, because, uh, because there's too much chaos. And there's something about that that I found intolerable and heartbreaking. Because as a kid, you have nothing going on, like nothing. And the only thing that you know how to mark the transition of a year is the first day of school. You remember the first day before sixth grade? Like it was really monumental because sixth grade meant something. And the first day of high school, the first day before your senior year. And I know for many of my students, that first day of college is a moment that is marked, that's imprinted on us as a moment of our personal growth, of our maturity. And the idea that, that this type of disruption would stay not only with the town of Ferguson, but the children of Ferguson for the rest of the school year really, really hurt me. And in thinking about what I could do, because I'm not creative, um, but I do believe in teaching. And so I made a simple request on Twitter, which I think Twitter is so weird, because it's really for people, <laughs> like, when I think about people who really own Twitter, it's like Kim Kardashian, Justin Bieber, the Pope. Um, the Pope has crazy followers, and then our president. Like, think about that, right? So anyway, so when I think about Twitter, though, I do think about the way it has allowed academics to create community about things that are important to us. And so Professor Twitter, although not very cool, is an effective way of taking the temperature of a lot of educators at the same time. And so I made one request. As we approach the first day of classes, can you dedicate the first day to Michael Brown and to the other children and young people of Ferguson, Missouri, who would not have a first day of school? We understand how important the first day of school is, you, and we understand that it is the moment where we set the tone and we shape the course of the school year. So how important would it be for us to decide that our school year would be shaped by the idea that we go to school to further understand the chaos and the complication and the sadness of the world, not to ignore it. This was a very, very simple request. And I don't really, I didn't even really know how to use Twitter that well, um, but, so, but people found it. And what happened is we started to get more creative about the ways that we were going to talk about the unspeakable in our classrooms. And so what started as just a plea to my colleagues in academia turned into a conversation with the K through 12 community. How as an educator in higher ed could I reach out and be of service to the K through 12 community? And I would get these messages from 10th grade teachers. My school principal said that we're not allowed to talk about Ferguson, but we're going to talk about it. How are we going to get around this? How are we going to creatively engage students in a conversation about the consequences of race, of poverty, of police brutality, of the victimization of the poor, of the marginalization of black bodies, of the creation of Black Lives Matter and of protests? How are we going to do that without saying those things? And then I started to expand the way that I thought about teaching. What can we show young people 
when we are in a repressive environment, take notes, when we are in a repressive environment, what can we show young people to know that something else is possible? And in that process, what I found is that the hashtag syllabus idea could become a shorthand for a type of creative response. So that after the uprising in Baltimore, Maryland, after the killing of Laquan McDonald in Chicago, after the killing of Sandra Bland in Texas, we had a way as an academic community to share with each other what could work in the various environments in which we teach. This is something that showed me the profound impact of creating a community of teachers that are sharing our ideas and our best practices in moments of crisis. So that wherever we were, whether we knew each other or not, we knew that on the same day we were all going to do the same thing. When Joel talks about the idea of creative mornings, everyone around the world doing the same thing at the same time, this gives us an incur incredible amount of courage to move forward. And for this, I'm incredibly grateful. I had an opportunity to write about this for, um, for Lenny Letter, and someone made an illustration of me, and I thought that was really so unusual, but it was pretty cool because it was a different way, right, of signaling what social justice teaching could look like. Um, and that has been an incredible experience. And the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to stop talking, and hopefully we'll have time for some great questions, is I was invited um, last year to be part of a criminal justice podcast called Undisclosed. If you listen to Serial Season 1, Undisclosed Season 1 was the response to Serial. It's kind of like the diss track, like this is really the truth. Um, it's, it's excellent. And it um, was headed by um, Adnan Syed's dear friend, Rabia Chaudhry. Um, and through like just a bunch of stuff that happened, stuff, um, I was invited to be part of their 16-week podcast about the killing of Freddie Gray and the Baltimore Police Department. And criminal justice podcasting is so wildly different than most of the academic spaces I'm in. Um, the first episode, I think, I want to say 250,000 people listened, which is bananas. No one listens to me. Um, you know, an over-enrolled class has maybe 43 students, and I'm so stressed out. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all this grading. And there are 250,000 listeners. And I think Undisclosed just hit something like 200 million downloads. It's incredible. But this is a platform that a lot of academics aren't part of. And so what was I going to say about the killing of Freddie Gray? We know it's a tragedy. What are we going to say about the Baltimore Police Department? They've had unchecked power for, for decades. Um, we know all of these things. So what was I going to provide? I was going to talk to a lot of people about history. And in working on the Freddie Gray podcast and spending time in Baltimore, one of the things that I was struck with was how we were going to narrate without um, visual assistance the beautiful tributes to Freddie Gray and his life that are all over the city of Baltimore, particularly in the Sandtown neighborhood. How are we going to express why people, some of Freddie's friends, some strangers, decided it was important to memorialize him and others in this way? And so the beginning of the process wasn't the research on the history of the Baltimore police, though that was part of it. The first thing we did was went down to Gilmore Homes and Sandtown and talked to people, but, but looked at the murals, looked at the ways that people decided to memorialize a life that a large portion of the country was telling us didn't matter and was not valuable. And in these processes of doing history on a criminal justice podcast, I hope that my contribution was to bring people closer to the idea that when we are stuck on the issue of how do we understand equality for others, that perhaps history is our greatest tool, even if it is not always predictive, but it is our greatest tool to understand why the fight is so hard. There is a giant boulder of inequality in front of us, and it is very easy to believe that we cannot push it. But when we understand how much it took for it to get even halfway up the mountain, we become more forgiving with ourselves and others in the mistakes we made make along the way. That the story of Freddie Gray did not begin in April of 2015. It began in 1864 in the state of Maryland with, with the, um, the struggle against slavery. And it continued on and on. And in telling that long story of a short life, I hope 
I'm able to really illustrate to my fellow historians that when we are more creative about how we do our work, we have more impact in the world around us. So I remain completely committed to the idea that I am not creative. But what I am is extremely grateful for all of the creatives in our world today and in worlds past who are able to give us more tools and more language to really think about how we are going to create our own vision of equality. Thanks a bunch, folks.